Hey everybody, for this podcast, I'm lucky enough to be joined by researcher, writer, and multi-talented artist David Metcalf, and a gentleman I'm lucky enough to call a buddy. We've had about a dozen conversations in the past year, and it wasn't uncharacteristic for those conversations to last for upwards of four hours, which my friends and family can both testify to. We've met only once, and that was for a talk at the observatory where we hung out with George Hansen who is uh, professionally employed in parapsychology laboratories for eight years. Uh, three years at the Rhine Research Center and five at the Psychophysical Research Laboratories in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, so we've been wanting to record one of these and now we have something to go on, which is Santa Muerte. And the reason why I want to talk about this right now is because I was totally aware that you were studying Santa Muerte but I didn't get it at all until literally about 7 or 8 o'clock last night. <laughs> Which led to hours and hours of reading and research, as well as several texts to you. And then I did a little thought experiment with Santa Muerte, uh, which we'll talk about later because I'm sure you did one as well. <laughs> but I wanted to talk to you now before I had time to really think about it and draw conclusions because I realized that's part of the magic of Santa Muerte is how it enters your consciousness because we're really going to be having a conversation about death tonight and I come from a lineage of southern funeral directors so it's part of my upbringing and uh, David had a brilliant idea for a kind of corporate death therapy service where a CEO is placed in a casket which was something we talked about the second or third time we ever talked about anything. But nevertheless, the conversation tonight is going to be about death and uh, specifically Santa Muerte. So, David, you're doing right work right now with another scholar, a very serious scholar named R. Andrew Chestnut, who's an author and a Ph.D., and I think he's a chair of Catholic Studies somewhere? Yeah, he's a chair of Catholic Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, so... He's, uh, he's kind of the leading scholar, definitely the leading scholar in English on Santa Muerte. And um, in looking at some of the, the Spanish language stuff as well, I would say that his scholarship um, stands up to anything that's going on, you know, on the ground in Mexico. So, Wow. And are you guys, you guys have done an article together on HuffPo, and you're, uh, are you both working on um, that website, Skeleton Saint, is it? Yeah, we're we're collaborating on the research, and uh, Andrew's working on a a new book. Um, his first book, devoted to death. Well, not his first book, but his first book on Santa Muerte, um, devoted to death, just got translated into Spanish and published in Mexico City. Um, so he's now uh, he's now working on a second one. Um, and we're kind of collaborating on the research for that. So, so you guys are like the Santa Muerte gringos in North America right now. Yeah, it's kind of strange. Um, when I first encountered Santa Muerte, I think it was 2005, and uh, I was actually working at a marketing agency and was kind of given carte blanche to uh, just research trends and that kind of thing, do trend spotting. And uh, Santa Muerte was one of the things that popped up because um, that was about when I think the mainstream media really caught hold of the fact that there were people in Mexico and coming into the United States that, um, you know, were paying devotion to a, a female Grim Reapress, um, which was kind of shocking to the American media because it wasn't, it's interesting the way the, the devotions have kind of developed and the traditions developed because it's been kind of an underground tradition for uh, decades. Um, and it actually, you know, in some ways goes back hundreds of years. So uh, when, in 2001, when Dona Cata made the first uh, public shrine in Tepito, uh, which is a barrio in Mexico, um, when she brought the first public shrine forward, the devotional system was already, you know, somewhat developed. Um, so when it reached the U.S. media, it was kind of like the, you know, this underground tradition that had been going on in Mexico and you know parts of LA and parts of the United States where there was a, a large Latino population um, that you know it was kind of fully formed so when the the media got a hold of it you know here's all these people paying devotion to this Grim Reaper figure and it kind of blew the minds of a lot of people including myself when I first saw the news stories but I never thought 
you know, a tradition from Mexico City and some of the most uh, violent neighborhoods in that was going to be something that I have an opportunity to look into. Um, but when Andrew did his when Andrew's book got published, I jumped right on it to get an interview with him. And uh, since I'd been studying it, you know, on my own, uh, we got into a good conversation. And since then, um, we co-presented at uh, Morbid Anatomy Library um, on a talk of probably one of the first lectures um, outside of Andrew's uh, on Santa Muerte. And then, you know, we've kind of grown into a sort of collaborative research thing where we, uh, you know, share information on that. So it's definitely been interesting. Now, there's a bunch of places we could go to right there, but before we go there, one thing I'd like to bring up is the only other people probably lecturing in the United States about Santa Muerte are law enforcement officials. Yeah, that's that's right. That's a good, yeah, that's a good call. Yep. Yeah, uh, uh, please. Specifically, uh, U.S. Marshal uh, Robert Del Monte, uh, he, uh, he's been going around, I think, for quite a while doing law enforcement um, seminars and that, trying to get people aware of Santa Muerte. Um, uh, it, you know, and it, it's contentious too because El Monte, uh, you know, at first I saw what, he, I saw the information that he was presenting and I was kind of offended by it. Mm -hmm. um, but with the recent Catholic uh, clarifications on their uh, um, condemnation of the tradition, mm -hmm. in looking back on what El Monte was saying, um, he's unique in the fact that he doesn't give a blanket condemnation of all Santa Muerte's followers and actually tries as best he can within the um, auspices of being a, you know, fairly average, you know, guy and plus being a U.S. Marshal, you know, he tries to be neutral with it. So um, it seems to me more, you know, looking at it and kind of giving him the benefit of the doubt, it seems that he's just confused over this tradition, which suddenly has become part of his job, you know, to deal with what he sees as a death cult. Know, coming out of Mexico. So you can imagine a U.S. Marshal in that position is probably a bit confused and concerned, you know, um, compared to some of the stuff coming out from uh, folks like um, Bishop Pfeiffer, uh, who's a bishop in Texas, um, who just flat out says Santa Muerte is satanic and diabolical. Um, the stuff that El Monte's saying seems to be a little bit more open-minded you know, within the context of what, what he can say, you know, being a law enforcement official. Well, that's, that's something I was really, really curious about because um, it is, the situation is so intense, um, no matter where you look at what angle you look at this thing from, it's escalating, it's, it's really intense. I mean, the situation is as hardcore as it can get because there's this oppressive element that's developed. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, the bishops now who are coming out against it. I saw a clip of Alex Jones, uh, who is, you know, of course, like <laughs> characteristically hysterical and just saying, it's diabolical, folks. It's utterly diabolical. And the <laughs> only thing that could, like, come to mind, of course, was like, well, how many years are we away from a representative of Santa Muerte being on, you know, Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman and Juan Gonzalez saying, no, no, this isn't just a narco <laughs> saint, folks. This is, like, a really important part of, like, uh, contemporary religious development that's happening right now. So that was something, because there is this oppressive, like, okay, so before we get into really what Santa Muerte is, let's talk about the, the like, oppressive uh, energies around it, because, of course, we have... Uh, in 2009, 40 or so altars to Santa Muerte was destroyed on the Mexican border by the Mexican government. From uh, And this is something I heard from your colleague, how it's just the whole thing is being ravaged, you know, by the bishops, government officials, um, and that it's 40% uh, of the prison population. But then again, from what I understand now, 10 has 10 million followers, so of course you're going to have criminal elements when you have 10 million followers. Uh, but could we go into that? Could you tell me about this, This uh, how it's being repressed from all angles? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, obviously it's a very complicated uh, situation. And when we're talking about 
um, when we're talking about the different groups, I think one of the things that I found is that it's really important to to step into their shoes, mm -hmm. which, funny enough, is a, a lesson from Santa Muerte's neutrality. You know, because she has she has devotees who are prison guards, who are policemen, and so we'll take. I mean, taking it from the law enforcement, uh, you know. Uh, drug cartel, narco saint kind of angle. Um, she's got devotees on both sides of the, the you know, kind of war. And um, so there's the policemen who, I mean, I think there's, there's one uh, district in Mexico where the policemen actually have uh, patches of Santa Muerte on their uniforms as kind of like a, you know, a, a protection charm. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's not really. It's not as black and white as it may appear in the media. Right. And so, you know, every every group that's kind of getting involved in this, on the on the end of trying to uh, figure out what Santa Muerte is, and you know, either uh, kind of sound a word of caution or you know, actively stop the the devotions. Um, all those groups, you know, it's it's just really desperately important to understand them as well. You know, because. Um, with the police, like I said, there's policemen who are Santa Muerte devotees, you know, and who see it, you know, one way. With the police who are trying to stop it, a lot of what they're looking at is you have a decentralized faith tradition whose main symbol is a Grim Reaper. Right. Now, when you have that situation, and you also have, uh, you know, cartels who are decapitating people, skinning people alive, uh, posting public executions on uh, YouTube, you know, I mean, when you have that kind of situation and you've got this iconography which has no control over it and whose basic, you know, element is a symbol of death, um, that's pretty scary to the law enforcement and justice officials because, um, you know, if you look at the potentials behind that iconography for spurring violence, it's huge. You've already got situations where um, there was one family who was, uh, you know, giving blood ritual by killing people in front of their altar. Um, you know, there's rumors of something called a blood baptism where, uh, you know, the um, gang member or whatever is baptized into the, the Santa Muerte devotions by killing someone and then wearing their skin. Jeez. What, you know, and whether or not that's true... When you see people being decapitated and you know by cartels and probably by corrupt police as well, um, when you're living in that kind of confusion and then suddenly you've got this, uh, like I said, decentralized uh, faith tradition whose main figure is a figure of death, um, that causes <laughs> you know that some concern and alarm uh, <laughs> to, to try to stop that, you know, and so. And from that, you know, from that angle, I, I can see where where they're coming from. But at the same time, when you're not in that position, when you're not a law enforcement official, you know, and when you're simply looking at their tradition as it is in reality, the you know, like you said, the numbers of uh, her devotees and then are not they're not criminals, mm -hmm. you know. And and if you look at where she's active, if you have a faith tradition in largely impoverished areas which grew out of people's relationship to poverty, their relationship to, you know, uh, corrupt uh, official groups, whether it's the church or the state, um, you know, or neighbors who are violent or whatever. Um, you know, when you're, when you're looking at that from the outside, you realize that, okay, so a guy gets arrested with uh, a tattoo of Santa Muerte and he happens to be, you know, uh, a contract killer. Well, he's got a mother. And he's got a father, and he may have brothers and sisters. He's got cousins, aunts, uncles, and all that. They may be devotees too. Are you going to claim that they're because they're in a in a environment that has these elements of violence to it? Are you going to say that they're all criminals? You know, and and so you get into this question of uh, where does where does criminality spawn from? Which I think is something really valu valuable with looking at the tradition neutrally. You start to see a different. A different aspect of criminality than we're normally presented with this black and white, like, you know, criminal, not criminal, uh, you know, criminal environment, not criminal environment. There's, you start to develop a nuance by, through the lens of Santa Muerte, you know. And then with the church, you've got a situation where she just simply doesn't fit in with uh, church doctrine, mm. period. The, the theology of the Catholic Church could never 
uh, include Santa Muerte as she is um, in her current tradition. So, um, you know, what was brought up in the, the Mexican, the Conference of Mexican Bishops uh, clarification is the fact that uh, she's not a person. Um, something that, that comes as a surprise to folks in the U.S. who are used to, you know, concepts of gods, goddesses, paganism, uh, you know, pagan gods, the way that that kind of stuff all plays out in uh, the faith traditions that most people in the U.S. are familiar with. Um, Santa Muerte is very much death itself. And all her devotees will say that, that, you know, this isn't a goddess of death or whatever. This is death. Um, you know, and so within that context, she can't be sanctified. Um, Santa Muerte translates as Saint Death. That's its most accurate translation. And uh, so within Catholic theology, um, only persons, you know, only people can be, who were flesh and blood and actually living, uh, can be sanctified. So um, right there, Santa Muerte can't be a part of the Catholic Church. Um, you know, and so... I, with and then with the, so with the Catholic issue, I think what comes in then is a question of, you know, the excessive focus on Satanism and uh, you know devil worship claims. Um, to with again within Catholic theology, Christ defeated death. So, and the figure representing death uh, becomes Satan. Because, you know, in the, the fall, what's the, what's the fall is the introduction of death into the Garden of Eden and the expulsion of man and woman. And so, you know, Satan as the tempter and that kind of thing, uh, Satan, you know, brings death into the world. So within that definition, again, uh, Santa Muerte would be technically a satanic religion um, within the Catholic theology. So, you know, the Catholic Church's reaction uh, is you know pretty much just based on the doctrine. There's not much else that they can do, um, other than condemn it, you know, and make sure people recognize that this is not Catholic theology that's going on, you know. With all that said, the tradition itself, again, when you're not Catholic and you're just looking at it from the tradition, uh, is much different than the picture painted by uh, the Catholic Church. There's a couple of places we could go right there. Let me start from uh, the beginning where you were talking about the law enforcement's involvement with Santa Muerte and the iconography thereof. Um, because uh, uh, Andrew Chestnut mentioned that when he was down in the uh, the Mecca, if you will, of Santa Muerte, which is, what's the name of that area? Um, when he was in Tepito? I think, yeah, I think it was Tepito. He was in Tepito and he came across a lawyer and he said the lawyer um, was uh, saved from his kidnappers by Santa Muerte. So even even the lawyers, right, 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 and that you know there's a there's a specific um, candle color for justice, which can be used by lawyers to uh, not just color. I'm sorry, I can't a color association because um, it could be a statue. It can be you know any ways that you would color in a ritual, but a color association specifically for justice. Which again can be used by lawyers, judges, uh, prosec you know, people who are being prosecuted, or defendants. So her neutrality really plays into this fact that anyone in a profession where they're dealing with, you know, they're struggling with some kind of difficulty or whatever, uh, depending on the level of that difficulty and you know their personal beliefs, Santa Muerte can be something that they go to. Now I know we haven't really gone into what Santa Muerte is yet. But there's one last thing I'd like to go into before we do, and that is how it started spawning in Mexico. Because it started as an esoteric club, that it started with a small group of elites, in the sense of that they were like celebrities or something like that. In other words, they, they probably, had, but there was also a woman, from what I understand, the, uh, I think it's the Romeo family down there who's, who's been uh, worshiping or being yes. a devotee for 57 years, but prior to yes. that... That's Dona Keita, yeah. Oh, Dona, okay. Um, but prior to that, it was part of, like, the upper echelon of society, and yet now it's this street folk religion that is stretches from Chile to Canada. Right. And, well, and the, the, the elite thing is a rumor. Uh, uh, 
there's a, a I forget if he's a journalist or a writer, but he wrote uh, a fictionalized account which he claimed was based on real facts. Oh, about um, the thing. I mean, presumably, I suppose he's a trustworthy source, but he did write it as fiction, and there is uh, that's not a not a proven claim. That would definitely be like a hearsay kind of thing. But it, looking at um, you know where her tradition did come out of. Uh, in the 1940s, it was written about in terms of love magic, um, and there, you know, the there was a specific novena, uh, you know, a series of prayers that went along with this love spell that was associated with Santa Muerte. So, um, within the context of uh, Mexican culture, where uh, folk magic has had a lot more strength over the years. Um, I could definitely see, you know, because it's focused on love magic and that, that could definitely start to attract, you know, every level of society. All right. Well, then let's talk about now what is Santa Muerte? Because I guess everyone deserves to hear it now. <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, death. I mean, that's uh, Dona Keita. Uh, there's a... Uh, a good short documentary on Monster TV, um, which is on YouTube, um, where Donicate is quoted as, you know, essentially just, it is death. You know, that there's no, no goddess, it's not a god. Um, the reason that devotees can say uh, that Santa Morte is second only to God is that she is quite literally the thing that uh, ends everything. Um, yeah, I mean, it's that she is the, she's death, I don't know, you know, she's the, the transition point for everything. So the thing that makes things partiality, you know, if you think about uh, God as a whole, and then what splits that up into things that are individual, you know, parts, uh, she's that force. So she is, uh, to her devotees, is literally, you know, second only to God. She's the thing that makes reality possible. She is death. When we talk about Santa Muerte, Saint, Death, and all these like wonderful nicknames. I think you probably know them off the top of your head better than I do. What are some of them? La Flaca and La Nina Blanca. Uh, the Godmother. Yeah, La Madrina. Is, that's one of my favorite ones. Yeah, I like I, that one. I think that defines uh, her practical work very well. You know, if you think in terms of a Godmother, and also kind of points to that second only to God thing. Mm. Because if you think what what the function of a godmother or a godfather is within Catholicism, it's to guide the you know, the kid up into God, to introduce them to God, you know, and, and that holy relationship. And then if you look at the way that her devotees talk about her, that's exactly what her relationship is to them. You know, they they feel that when they die, they pass through Santa Muerte to go to God. You know, so she's the the last thing that happens. And in some sense, you know, when they're born, they go from non-existence to existence. So their state in non-existence dies, and then they're born. And so she becomes this very complex, uh, you know, figure who's there at birth and death. And, um, you know, is basically the godmother to their existence. It made, when I really started getting into it, I realized it as a kind of guardian angel figure that is always present with life. I mean, in the room with you. And that's something I want to get into you, I mean, with you later is the uh, death anxiety and the fact that, you know, not just ourselves, but many other creatures on the planet understand death and death anxiety. Um, elephants, of course, mourn, and uh, there is these... Uh, wonderful photographs that were circulating online for a while of a tiny bird, I think a sparrow, mourning um, another dead sparrow. And it was like really intense, very touching sort of photograph because it was kind of an undeniable image. It was a series of images. Um, so this is like a real thing that, that we're all conscious of. And here we have this, I mean, let's, let's say cult, because even they call it a cult, the culto. Uh, that is focused on this presence that is death for life. In other words, like death is unavoidable for living things. It is always in the room with you. And 
There is at one end of us a biological need to keep death away so we survive, but then as uh, higher life forms, we of course are well aware that uh, the trend is for us to eventually die, to meet her, to meet the holy death, the Santa Muerte. That's, that's an inevitability. Um, you know, medical science has yet to take us beyond it, and then even if it did, well, how do you know if a star is not going to explode in your neighborhood or whatever? But <laughs> <laughs> that kind of idea that death, Santa Muerte, as a kind of guardian angel figure, what do you 